You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ask Drone You. As always, my name is Paul. My name is Rob. Thankful to be sitting here hanging out, um, knowing at least a few of you are out there. Appreciate you spending a few minutes of your day with us. We know you've got a lot of choices. Dang, there's a lot of choices of what to do with your time. And so for those of you that are hanging out with us, thank you very much. We want to make it worth your while. And uh, that's our goal today. I think we will. Yeah, thank you very much as well. And thank you for all of our members that support the community. Um, Today's podcast comes from a caller asking about um, the right pathways or navigation of getting uh, started in his drone business. And we've kind of, we've hit this one before, I think a little bit earlier this year, but I think to add more information, what we're gonna do is kind of uh, discuss maybe the attempted timelines that you might face as a pilot going after some of these opportunities and how to maybe limit those timelines to ensure a more rapid progression in your drone business because um you know it's not just the it's not just the drone opportunities rob it makes me think of how we go about with working uh with some of these clients and I think another thing that we could add in this show is things to be wary of, uh, maybe methodologies of protecting oneself because we just went through something recently of, you know, giving a client a little, you know, extra help or whatever ended up being a huge mistake because they just wanted more and more and more and more and more. (laughs) And I had to reinforce the boundaries quite significantly and forcefully to say, look, Mm. we were trying to help you out. You're taking this too far. We gave an inch. You took a mile. So, uh, you know, anything that's on us, we will fix. Anything else that you want as part of this project is going to be extra. And I just had to put my foot down and say, look, I like you, man. But this takes more and more time. Everything that you're asking, I know why you're asking it. I totally understand why you're asking it. I just don't think the consideration of how much time it's going to take to get these things done is being considered. And that's why we have to put up our boundaries and say, look, you're going to have to pay for this. So I think what, uh, you know, what um, opportunities, time frame of opportunities, and then also methodologies of going about these opportunities, I think will be kind of the topic for today's show. Obviously, we do have a question. It's just that we've hit this question kind of before of what are the best opportunities for drone pilots moving forward. Um, And so I think in an effort to add to that information, we hit these other things that I've mentioned today. So Sounds good. Makes me think of the uh, the old book. I think I've brought it up before. Um, give a moose a cupcake. They'll, I can't remember exactly how it ends, but they'll want another cupcake, basically. It never mm, ends. Yeah. And it goes through this whole progression. You give them this, and they want this, and they want this added, and then they want this. It's pretty funny. Well, you Kids know, book. I saw this reel this weekend, Rob, that really made me think, and before we get into the question, I just want to touch on this. And it was about clients that ask about discounts. And the uh, the guy was saying, look, any any buyer who asks for a discount, this is actually a good thing because it showcases the buyer's intent. He's already made the decision to buy. And he says the way that you should go about handling these quote unquote discounts is by essentially saying, you know, this is the lowest that I can go on the price. If you want, I can go higher. I mean, literally just coming back and saying, I can do more. I'm already giving you a deal. Like, you know, I love that you're interested, but at the same time, I'm happy to charge more and just like be silent and let them come back on that. I will also say, I want you to think of either asking for discounts or giving discounts. If this was your friend's business, would you really want to ask for a discount or would you want to fully support his business and maybe support it? Like how a lot of people on Instagram support celebrities that are lots of show and no go. So anyway, my two cents. Good point. Yeah. Something to think about for sure. So it looks like you got the hungry moose pulled up. If you get, it's a muffin. If you give uh, a moose a muffin, they'll want jam and then they'll want uh, all the muffins. And then when you run out of muffins, they'll want to go to the store to get muffin mix. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll want that grass fed butter. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh exactly. man! All right. I'll, I'll never forget that at Thanksgiving. I can taste the grass in the butter. It's healthy. <laughs> it's good stuff. All right. Um, our show today is brought to you by uh, Drony Membership with over forty classes to help you monetize your drone business. It's the biggest library of drone classes and the most value out there. We have not even risen raised prices. Excuse me. In the wake of inflation, so make sure you pick up a membership today. Forty seven dollars is going to give you literally dozens of ways to monetize your aircraft, have fun, build great business relationships, and build a scalable business from the start. Check it out, thedroneu.com. Hey, Rob. Hey, Paul. My name is Andrew, and I'm calling from the Hudson Valley, New York. Been listening to your guys' podcast for a couple months, and I love the content you're putting out. I really do. Uh, Keep it up. So my question for you guys today is... What do you think is the best avenue to get started in with commercial droning? So I've been looking to get into the industry, currently studying for my Part 107 license exam. And yeah, I've got a couple drones. I got a DJI Mini 2, Mavic 3, and a P4P Pro V2. Now, I've been considering starting with local roof inspections and or real estate and seeing where that goes. But I do want to get into mapping. Yeah, I just would love some advice as to what do you think is the best avenue to get started in with this industry? I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Andrew. Um, first of all, pretty nice fleet he's starting with. Uh, yeah. There's uh, a lot that uh, you can do with that, Andrew. So it's a particularly pertinent question given the fleet of drones that you have because you have some pretty solid opportunities there. Um. Yeah. um, I think one of the things that we wanted to talk about, too, was what what defines low hanging fruit nowadays? Well, yeah, with the idea that these newer pilots are going to go after this low hanging fruit for, you know, paid practice or just trying to dip their toes in. And I think you bring up a really good point of what low hanging fruit is is really out there anymore, Uh, because even. The low hanging fruit can take you to higher paying jobs like Cinewhoop fly throughs or fly through tours. That company based here out of Denver, the uh, inside drone tours, they're just like literally taking off. And, you know, back in the day, we knew what? Real estate, um, roof inspections, maybe some cell tower inspections were the low hanging fruit. How do you think that low hanging fruit has evolved or changed as a whole? Well, I don't even know that I would consider – so I think for me, in, in my sort of um, layman's perspective, even though obviously I've been involved in the industry for a long time, it's always been the something real estate related as low-hanging fruit. Maybe some commercial stuff where you're helping a local business get some aerials of their business, mm. that kind of thing. I would probably put that into the category of low-hanging fruit. I do not think that inspections of any kind were low-hanging fruit – even a few months ago, but I think it's sort of evolved into that maybe a little bit just because there's more um, consideration there. I think the people that need that service, that benefit are seeing the value and so there's more opportunity there. So it's kind of a natural progression for a drone pilot. But um, in terms of how the the, the term low-hanging fruit has evolved, I would say it's probably starting to include some inspection stuff, especially like residential roof inspections, that kind of thing. I don't know that I would include personally like cell tower inspections in that because what seems to be the case there is a lot of networking is involved. Mm. There's got to be some solid relationships because so many of the cell towers are now owned by, they're like, they're like the new AT&Ts of the world, right? What was that? Uh, what was that tower company? Uh, gosh, this there was one that we were talking to that owned, man, and that's a public company. I was trying to remember the name of that. I can't remember it either. Yeah, but I mean, it's a public company, so it's it's massive. Well, I think also we've seen with these cell tower inspections specifically that sometimes it can be a sketchy opportunity. I mean, just in the last uh, training that we had, we had two pilots who were being asked to do cell tower inspections and had already done some and hadn't been paid yet and were like 120 days past due and they were being asked to do more. And it was like, well, pay me for the ones I've already done and then we'll talk about, you know, doing the new ones. And they essentially blew them off. And so I will say with that particular industry vertical, I think it's it's wise to be careful 
and uh, uh, I, I, I've just heard of some some pilots being raked over the coals, and so mm-hmm. I think there's just a, a good fair warning there. I think it's uh, the nature of sort of the wild, wild west of an industry. It's sort yeah. of still in that realm. And so you've got people who are pretty good at rallying the troops, so to speak. And when you have, so it's, frankly, it's a supply and demand thing in some ways, which is why you need to really develop your skills, get really good at networking, get really good at doing things like expressing your value in multiple ways, social media, networking, et cetera. Because you've got these people that are the aggregators. And I don't necessarily mean the drone bases of the world. I mean, people out there that are good at networking, say online, which of course, they can reach a lot of people. They bring in the business and they farm it out. Well, they know that if pilot A is pissed off that they didn't get paid, no big deal. I'll go find pilot B. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, man, I think the more of us that number one demand to get some payment up front even if it's half a quarter something get some skin in the game it's going to help the industry as a whole because um, it's an issue because there's a lot of people that for obvious reasons it's a great industry to be in but it's just still in that in that phase of people trying to figure it out and people taking advantage of that because as much as we all love capitalism it also affords those opportunities Totally, totally. And when thinking about, you know, the type of different low hanging fruit jobs that you could go after, you know, I think it's important to also think about how can these low hanging fruit jobs kind of transition or transform into the stuff that he wants to do. Mm. You know, he mentioned mapping. And so low hanging fruit, what about working for roofing contractors and doing like our commercial roofing inspection course that we're about to come out with to very different from residential? Um, You know, it involves mapping. It's not 2D. It's also 3D. Now, the image acquisition methodologies in that course are evolved from the mapping course. They're simplified. It's a it's a really killer system. But that said, if he gets in with roofing contractors and he's like, hey, look, I can help uh, reduce the number of change orders, increase the accuracy of estimates, reduce the amount of trips that to a particular site. I can increase client engagement for you guys by showcasing beautiful 3D models of these commercial properties so that you guys know exactly what work has to be done, how to keep a project on time, and then mapping it throughout the timeline of the project we can see that progression in real time, we can make better decisions, and we can also ensure that the work that we have done, we have like a record of the installation essentially of it. Mm -hmm. And then we can showcase that transformation of the project over time. And now you're not just helping them make database decisions, you're helping them showcase their value to other clients. And I think, you know, as far as an evolution of low hanging fruit, I think commercial roofing inspections are now a low hanging fruit, meaning working directly for roofing contractors. And we also say that because we've got a course coming out on props. It's an entire course set actually. And uh, this will be, this will blow a lot of minds for our regular listeners. It is not using Pix4D. So yeah. Yeah. So a new partnership with, what? Oh, yeah, I know, Ryan, uh, a new partnership with Optelos. <laughs> what have you done with Paul? <laughs> <laughs> a new partnership with Optelos is allowing us to use Bentley context capture to create even more lifelike 3D models, which are, they, they come out really, really, really sharp with really minimal data. So well, and, and great mechanisms for sharing the data with clients. Yeah, totally. They really, they really have nailed that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So if you remember, Rob, uh, someone had asked this question, like I said, I think it was Q1, Q2 this year, and we came up with this mind map of all these different opportunities. And we're not going to go through that mind map. But what I do want to say is, you know, I think it's important when you're looking at low hanging fruit jobs or jobs as a whole to really consider, and we've said this before, the client navigation and how do you scale that from start to finish and how do you create business opportunities that are recurring revenue. I think the commercial roofing inspections, if you're working with a couple of set of contractors, that's going to be a great recurring revenue job. Solar inspections, great recurring revenue job. You know, communications inspections, great recurring revenue job. Um, and then construction inspections, progression inspections, great, you know, recurring revenue I job. I think that's a big one for somebody like this to get to try to get into. Well, and and that brings up my next point, which is one of the biggest things that's overlooked for these newer pilots is um, 
developing just one particular skill, i.e. mapping, rather than focusing on setting up the right foundation of skills. And we came up with that video that's on YouTube that you can watch about how to be a successful drone pilot. And we talk about this in that video that you've really got to be able to fly in close proximity. You've got to be able to not just fly fast and agile, but slow and smooth in close proximity, and then also be able to map. Because in the example of construction, like Rob just mentioned, this is not just creating an ortho, but it's also progression shots. It's, you know, beautiful photos of the project. It's beautiful video of the project. And so you're going to need all those skill sets to really crush the competition. And one thing I will say to try to encourage people who may feel stuck in their business or who are just getting started, that at the end of the day, quality and consistency are going to be the key drivers of uh, getting your business going and growing. There are still so many people who half-ass this stuff. And if you can make it really easy and convenient to work with you, you're very punctual and you create systems that are backed by good skill. Frankly speaking, I think there is still a huge opportunity to start a drone business and overcome uh, a lot of the existing competition that's out there because a lot of people, you know, they build their marketing stuff. It looks great, but they don't put, you know, feet to the pavement and actually mm -hmm. build the networking stuff or build their network as a whole, build those relationships, do community outreach, et cetera. And so I think that there is a huge opportunity to really create that systematic, scalable business, focus on client relationships, you make it easy and convenient to work with you, you have boundaries, but you're also happy to help people. And I think that you're going to be doing just, just fine. So um, yeah, that video is doing great. Happy to see that. Um, so that said, um, when you are taking these low hanging fruits on, I want you to think about what is the transformation or transition in the jobs that you want? How do you transform into the recurring revenue jobs? How do you create the systems to support said jobs? And then can you put a time limit on the low hanging fruit? Like if you go out and do real estate stuff and after three months, it's just not hitting it's, or six months, it's just not hitting, move on. Like what is your plan? I think it's important to lay out a plan. And I think it's also important to lay out what skills you'll need as a drone pilot and how you're going to practice those, but also lay out what softwares that you might need to learn in order to be a good all around pilot. Because at the end of the day, if you can fly low, slow and smooth and you can do mapping, then you can do marketing for just about any company out there. And Rob, you hit something this morning on the show that I hope someone brings down a question. And if we do see a technical recession or even a pullback in the economy, one of the first things to go is advertising. Mm. We've also heard from uh, companies in 08, 09, while everyone was pulling back on advertising, they went further in yeah. and it made a huge difference for them. So I would love to see a question from the community about what is the right business strategy for my small business going into a potential recession? What can I focus on? You know, what uh, marketing materials or story do I focus on to get people engaged and buy from me? Um, because I will say I'm seeing Marriott's do these fly through tours all the time or not Marriott's, uh, I, IHG. Mm. Yeah. Um, what is that holiday Inn? So, um, that said, uh, it, they're, you know, that's, that's the skill of flying low, slow and smooth and then taking it to FPV and doing it without sensor assist. And, you know, DJI has got a new drone coming out this week, the Avada or whatever it's called, which is a Cinewhoop. But I think from what I'm seeing online, it might be a very underpowered Cinewhoop. And I have to say, uh, hashtag don't tell me where to fly DJI um, because Cinewhoop is the one drone I feel like that has really brought me back into the core of being a drone pilot and having that ultimate experience, that full control and that ability to just showcase skill on a level that, you know, a lot of people just don't have or they don't put the time into to acquiring. Hmm. More and more people are getting this and it's awesome to see. Yeah, there are. Um, but at the same time, 
you can really evolve your opportunities with that skill. And uh, I'm curious how this DJI release is going to go this week. You know, I'm sure we're going to see every YouTuber. Oh, it's the greatest drone ever. And then you'll see some FPV pilots be like, well, it's a 2S battery, so you really can't get that much acceleration or amperage draw. But is it going to have GPS, or is it going to be like full FPV Cinewhip style? According to our famous leaker, it doesn't even have a full manual mode. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Uh-huh. But you know what? That was a sarcastic awesome, just to clarify, correct? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. There will be a market for it, what, because it's fun. It's a toy. And that's cool. Yeah. And that's a, cool. It's, it's a good. toy. Definitely not a tool, but it's a toy. I also, I want to take a poll and wonder how many FPV pilots would actually pick up that drone. I'm I, Because it's the equivalent of a five inch FPV with two inch power. Uh-huh. Hmm. Well, we, got a fi- we have a five inch Cinewhoop mm-hmm. and I have a 6S battery on that so I can rip it, you know? And that gets you what, 10 minutes? No, four. Oh, jeez. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Well, how'd you do the uh, the stadium? Oh, that was only 90 seconds, huh? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. After every single shot, it was a dead battery. Yikes. I went through 11 batteries. Well, maybe it's a really efficient 2S battery. I don't know. <laughs> I think they're focused on flight time, not performance. And that's kind of like Cinewhoop is all about performance, you know? So it's just controllable performance. You know, yeah, it's all about slow and smooth, but sometimes you have to shoot a gap and it's a long gap and you have to cover a lot of distance. You ain't doing that on a 2S battery. So, but anyway, I kind of... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I will say, uh, you know, kind of going back to this, I do think Cinewhoop is a good opportunity and is an evolution of the skills. We've mentioned the layout. Um, as far as what direction to go, personally, I would focus on industries that are really more in the adaptation phase of using drones or the exploratory phase of using drones. Um, I think construction, I think solar I think commercial roofing inspections might be the next big low hanging fruit for everyone in all honesty. And I, and I'm also trying to be very objective in that, that it's not because we do have a new course coming up. Um, I just see more and more companies taking this on. And so that's Mm kind of why I'm like, Oh, this makes sense. So, well, yeah. And that's sort of a cart and a horse in the cart question too, because one of the reasons we might do a course is because we see something that's coming, not, not to create the industry, mm. but to aid the industry and Correct. bring it along, right? But one of the things that we've mentioned in this uh, type of podcast before, and by type I mean the subject matter, when it comes to answering this question is one of the best things that you can do. Number one is is do something you enjoy, if at all possible. But number two is what contacts do you have that will speed up the process of getting into whichever of these verticals you decide to go down. For example, if you know somebody that owns a big construction company and you know they're not getting the value from drones that they can slash should, you should be at their doorstep this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it depends on who you know and where can a door be, um, where's the door already open or at least a little bit open versus a door that you're going to have to kick down. Yeah. Utilize that existing network that you have. You might not think it's relevant, but you never know how you could talk to someone, open up a door and maybe they know a person or two people or three people. And, you know, it's all about relationships. I think sometimes we get lost in the weeds. Mm. Oh, this person just does that. Right. Well, yeah. Don't assume. Yeah. Don't assume. Yeah. Assume the positive, not the negative. If you're ready to um, scale your business, you need the right systems to do it. Check out the business course on props uh, where it helps you implement all those autonomous systems into your website. You might find it useful. There is also a business course on DroneU, something we want to update here in the next couple of years. But we do uh, really appreciate your questions. Another question I would love, 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 love to hear. And I'm actually really curious. So this is a total switch track offshoot. We're in the post game here of this question. Rob, I'm curious on your thoughts. I wanted to bring this up on our walk and I forgot. Remote ID. Uh, Remote ID is going through. On the survey, if you remember, we were very specific to ask our user base, this was last year's survey, of do you think other pilots will comply with remote ID? 
And I feel like in the last couple of years, we have ridden a wave of government entities trying to claim power that they do not have. And we simply comply and thus it's okay. Um, I think I'm curious what other pilots are thinking when we know drone pilots are being accosted, shot at, et cetera, and some of these more rural jobs, okay? Would pilots comply with remote ID? Um, because I know if I'm going to work in an area that I'm new to, I don't know it very well, there's not a set up means of communicating with local neighbors, et cetera. Um, I might hide my pilot location because I know that the federal case lost in court and I think the judge completely missed the boat. I, I, I'm actually surprised this is a federal judge, to be honest with you. Uh, I think the intellectual research and curiosity was non-existent because it comes down to a license plate system, right? Mm -hmm. You pass some old person going super slow in the right-hand lane and they're pissed because they are trying to slow you down and control traffic and whatnot. And it's like, you're not the police move over, you know, and then they pull your their phone out and they start recording you while they're driving. Okay, who cares? I have a license plate. They don't know where I live, right? Now, you fly a drone uh, to do a roof inspection and the neighbor thinks you're spying on someone because they don't know that you're there for the city and they pull up some app and pull up your location and go try to fight you because they think you're doing something nefarious. They're making a decision on emotion, not intellect or research. I can see a lot of pilots just saying, yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to comply. I could see that in certain cases. I could see a lot of pilots say, no, I want to comply because I want to normalize this and UTM and blah, 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 blah. But I'm really curious because I think that there are definitely some instances, and I'll say it on the show, that like if I'm doing a power line inspection in rural areas of certain parts of the country, I am probably not going to comply with remote ID because <laughs> I don't want to get shot. Like north, period. north of where we live. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So North and like West. Wellington. <laughs> and, yeah, that's not very far north yeah, either. That's what I'm saying. Wyoming. Holy cow, that's exactly. only an hour away. Yeah. So exactly. uh, yeah, Wyoming where where bullets fly a little bit more uh, easily <laughs> than they do elsewhere. A little loose with that trigger finger. Uh, uh, that's where I would be like, yeah, no. So, well, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question. I At this point, I put it at 50-50. <laughs> well, I'm curious. That's the safe answer because yeah. I don't know. I don't... Um, I think that... I think that most people... The desire is to be law abiding, right? And so when you talk about the government, sure. when you talk about the government not having power or trying to overstep, once it becomes a law, it becomes a power in a sense, right? And so I think that's what we're what we're getting to with this. And so they will have the power. Uh, I don't know if that, I mean, it's apparently all the resources are going to the IRS, so I don't think there's going to be any resources going to, uh, oh, geez. going, I don't, let's not go down that road, yeah. but just as a matter of, um, reality and the federal government's ability to, to back this thing up. I just don't know oh, that, like, because again, I do not think, and this the, isn't the ability to enforce remote ID, the ability to enforce it. And I do not think local law enforcement is going to give a crap. <laughs> Especially with the low levels of law enforcement, they, they it's like everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, the neighbor that uh, the neighbor who literally just moved in on the corner, ex chief of police of a certain particular East Coast city, mm -hmm. you know, he's like, No, I'm done, I'm done, I'm not doing this. When government doesn't have your back, you're practically a pawn in a game that you can't control. So mm, that's scary, it is scary. That's yeah, I feel bad for those people. That's why I love props public safety, like, I want to help the people who are like, you know what, I'm in this for my community. I'm going to help my community. I'm going to support my community. Well, you know what, sir I or ma'am, I want to support you. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult time. America was built on the ideology, Rob, that if uh, good men say nothing, evil prevails. And America was built on the ideology that if laws were implemented that were not reasonable, would go back to no taxation without representation, right? In 1913, they totally violated that, but people complied and thus it became law. In the 1770s, 1780s, people did not comply and things did not become law. And one thing that I think I've learned from my dad as a lawyer is that... Um, the law is only as good as the ability for people to comply and sovereignty is only as good as the credibility of one sovereignty, meaning that people have to see your sovereignty, 
Um, like for example, and, and accept I, it, accept it and not breach it. And I'm not just talking borders here. Um, you know, so I think that, I think that's something to consider. And, and I think you brought up a good point that the point is to be law abiding because we're not trying to, we're not trying to fire up a hornet's nest here. We want, um, structure. We want the evolution of the industry, but we also don't want to be shot at and personally threatened just to go do something that's very useful or fun, yeah. you know? So, um, and I, when I think of remote ID, the judge completely missed the point of a license plate. It's like license plate has inherent privacy for the driver, same as a drone pilot. So, um, I'm really bummed that Rupert and that race day quads team lost. Um, I think that this issue will have to be further fleshed out. Unfortunately, it's probably going to be at the cost of, pilots so anyway yeah i i hope not i mean because as we've learned a lot frankly it's sort of become the american way but we're very reactive um even like well i don't want to go down that road so we'll have to see hopefully hopefully bad things don't happen that lead to questioning the uh the original set up in the first place well yeah because the idea is to support more advanced operations right and like yeah. and that auvsi is like this is great i'm like well this shows who you support uh but at the same time like is it great i mean it's 90 percent great it's 10 percent shit so uh and uh unfortunately you know the 10 percent is applicable to 95 percent of the pilots and these bigger firms represent a very small portion of pilots so you know, it could, it could be a very, very interesting time. Luckily, we still don't have a full year until this takes place. So maybe there might be another legal challenge. But um, the FAA... Probably FA not, though. Yeah. But until the FAA gets 86,000 new agents, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this happens. <laughs> so um, I'm really worried for the state of our country. And it's so hard not to go down all those other right, rabbit we're not going to, though. Yeah, I can't get political. If you are a new pilot, focus on these things. Communicate with people. You'll be fine. Avoid rural areas for your first mapping missions. You're going to need you're going to need practice in conflict management and avoidance. This is a nature of any job. Uh, you know, surveyors have dealt with it for years. Police have dealt with it for years. Crap, p &M and the guys who check meters have had to deal with it uh, up until this day, you know, so. True. It's it's the nature of the beast. It is overcomable. And um, yeah, we appreciate the question. So if you have a question, ask Droney.com. 